the basic purpose from an engineering point of view uh, of those tests in West Virginia was to take a traditional locomotive. It's unmodified. It was a locomotive built in 1948, which really was state of the art in those days. It was a uh, passenger locomotive built for the chassis system, one of the last of its breed. It has a lot of uh, the latest technology of that era, but unmodified. And then the engine was heavily instrumented uh, by the Foster Wheeler Corporation, which is participating in the, in the boiler research. And so basically we had a 1948 locomotive with a lot of 1985 instrumentation to establish a baseline set of data about what a traditional engine is. Its efficiency, its, its smoke, its, uh, you know, the pollution, the, the uh, track dynamics, this kind of thing. Railroads haul today more ton miles of freight between cities than any other mode of transport. Uh, they haul more than trucks, more than waterways, uh, more than any of the other transportation modes. And so if, in fact, we could get what amounts to a third, it's about a third of the nation's ton mileage, onto domestic fuel, that would have obvious uh, national security implications, would have obvious implications for reducing our diet of foreign oil. Diesel's just hum and purr, but steam engines talk to you. I just love it. I could hardly sleep last night for thinking about today. This might be the last steam engine that ever pulled an Amtrak train in history. So you never know. We're just going to have some fun, taking the day off to enjoy ourselves. The American dancer took it and made it an art form. They're all kind of kinds of geniuses. Uh, certainly, Fred Astaire created a whole vocabulary of dance around his style. I mean, any man, who, anybody who can think of dancing with coat racks and rooms going upside down is a genius. You know? uh, but the black tap dancer, because he was always interested in improvisation and dancing to rhythms and jazz musicians, which made them part of the orchestra. We are percussionists. So they made it an instrument. So by John Bubbles dropping his heels, he could dance with any tempo, fit into any orchestra, and that's what they brought. And that enlarged the vocabulary of dance, which made it go to greatness. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, Rostikov in this movie that's dancing, he says, what's so wonderful about dancers is that we take from each other. We, we, we learn from each other. Dancers love to show other dancers what they do. And other dancers want to see it and want to learn it. So that's what I did, and it all fused together. How successfully, the audience tells me. Working with Francis Coppola, who I think is a genius, he's the most creative person that I've ever met. He's real childlike. He's very much like I am and, and people who are constantly looking for new. And he's never closed. And he, we had a, a long talk before, I did an improvisation of the breakup scene uh, to get the, the, the part. And uh, I explained to him that if I felt that the black side of the story was not done with integrity and class, I would leave the movie. I wasn't interested in the money. It never occurs to me. I, didn't, I was making a dollar ninety-eight anyway. <laughs> be frank with you. So none of that mattered to me. So, uh, and he understood that. And he said, well, you know, Maurice, I'm tired of seeing black actors saying what's happening, baby, anyway. See you tonight, baby. Hey, hey Sam, now, I got a special the act that's sick. Remember that song we talked about? Yeah. Can you do it tonight? Can a cat climb a tree? Come on, right after the Duke. I'm there. You took me. <laughs> what's this about a solo? Mm -hmm. They asked me to do a solo. Oh, oh, they asked you. You didn't ask them, huh? Rosie. I talked to them, yeah. Oh. Hi. Look, it's a step up, man. It's good for both of us. Don't give me trouble. Shake my hand. Shake your hand. Oh, the spitting. How could you do it to me? I'm your brother. How could you go behind my back? You want a solo? You got one. On stage and off. We fought. And we knew that we had to separate as brothers in order to preserve our relationship as brothers. We'd been together 25 years by that time. Uh, and so we broke up. When we reunited, Gregory began to understand my, uh, we're very volatile men, as it is. And uh, the rock business, uh, record business, became very unattractive to him after a while. I was doing um, a play uh, called Sarava. Uh, I auditioned for Yubi. Uh, which was the show about Yubi Blake, his music, review. And I called Gregory and I said, Gregory, you better get here. You have a daughter to support and you better, you turn it out here. I am turning it out because I could do everything. I could sing, I could dance, I could act, I could juggle, I could do everything. And so could Gregory. I said, but you can make some money. Come here. He came. We got, he got in the show. The opening night in the first preview at the Walnut Theater in Philly, we did this dance and we were supposed to go on to the next song. And we looked at each other and we just hugged and kissed and cried, just the way we did in that movie. So when you see us break up, we break up, and in the reuniting scene was real too. Japan, uh, Paris, London. We've been in Monte Carlo, but with another act, with my singing act that I include my dancers in. But Ballet Tap will go, yes, to all those countries now. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to showing and sharing my talent and, and educating the audiences about what, what I feel can be the greatness of tap. The tap art form has been thought of as a stepchild in dance. You know, it's always been after ballet or after modern or after Graham or after, you know, but it's not because it's the hardest technique because if you make a mistake, you can not only see it, but you hear it as well. So there's no margin for error.
there was no ominous feelings of any kind. And it occurred at 8.31 a.m. I fell right here on this spot here, as, can, as I point to, if it can be seen. Now, whatever happened after that, I don't know, until I woke up in the hospital. Basically, in a layman's term, it's just uh, determining, after you determine that there is not a pulse and that someone is not breathing, you actually breathe for them and cause their, their heart to push blood through the body so that the brain doesn't die. And tilt on the head. In the state of Washington, we prefer head tilt, chin lift. Originally, Seattle had the, the first three-hour class for uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So they developed the class and decided to teach the citizens. Now we teach classes at any location. We'll try to teach in a uh, church, community club, private residence. We make it as available as we can. Remember this four times. We have one instructor usually for a class of 20 to 25 people. The class would involve a lecture, which is explaining the access to the entire system, uh, what CPR is, and uh, generally what they can expect to find in case someone does collapse as a result of a heart attack, drowning, poisoning, any, any of the things that might cause someone to stop breathing. Then after the lecture, they do see a, a film which reinforces this information, and then they have a hands-on, which most people think the hands-on is most important because you get a one-on-one -on -one with the instructor that uh, he tells you how your hand placement should or should not be, what maybe you missed out of the class, so that in the three hours, it's all encompassing. It's only plastic. How many compressions was that? Four. Oh, 15. We've trained over 350,000 people in the Seattle King County area. No one else can compare to that. The chances of you actually having someone do CPR on you, probably one in three. If someone does CPR in the first couple of minutes, that being a citizen, that it greatly impacts the, uh, the chances of someone surviving. If my co-workers here had not been skilled in CPR, I would have been finished. I would never have gotten off the floor where I fell. I wouldn't. I would have been laying there. I would never have... Uh, I would have died, simply. In urban cities like New York, developers don't have that kind of time. A million dollar project, a hundred million dollar construction project may cost them for downtime a million dollars a month. So the archaeologists have to refocus their time frame to be able to do justice to the archaeological site in a drastically restricted time period.
the unwritten history sometimes doesn't match what was uh, supposed to have taken place. Uh, the ethnic or the cultural makeup of colonial people that we find in New York and the artifacts they use and the countries those artifacts came from are very different than many historical characterizations of only Dutch. We find that we had uh, 14 different languages spoken in 1625 in New York. These were not only Dutch, they were Swedes, they were Germans, they were English, they were coming from all over. And that real history, that human history, is reflected in the culturally important tools and artifacts that they used and left behind. that you had a positive three and a positive four. Well, your answer will be a positive seven, all right? If you had negative seven plus a negative three, then your answer is gonna be a negative 10. Now, can you see something that's common here? Like signs being added, the operation is addition now. Like signs being added will give you the same sign, all right? Now, another, the other yeah, one, so you're going to, from that decimal point back, you're going to put two zeros, you see, to put the decimal point up on top, you're going to, from that decimal point back, you're going to put two zeros, you see, to put the decimal point up on top, and you're going to have one zero, and you're going to have two zeros, and then we look at that thing, and we're going to say, gee, I guess it goes in two times, right, because what you're looking at is a 12. One of the things that uh, we are concerned about is making sure that we try to answer everybody's question. We don't want to leave anybody out. We want to try to make it a service so uh, they feel comfortable with us and we feel that we're providing a service to the community. Seven is two. Okay, so we have 22. And that's two. Okay. Now at this point we can write down our answer as 193 remainder 28. Let me, uh, let me, let me look at these and right. see if I can pick that up. You should get the week started right. Start now with that homework. Doing it, and then tomorrow, let us help you again, and then Thursday. Hello, I'm Milton Manning, and I go to visitation school in Tacoma, and I'm. I'm having problems with my fraction. Could you have the teacher show someone on the board and help me out? Okay, thank you. Bye. What I'm going to do, Vini, is use some of the problems from other callers and uh, solve those for you. And perhaps if you see that you don't understand still something about it, then you can call back and give me an example of what you'd like for me to go through with you. Okay, so this is uh, a no name, but they did give us a call. So I'm hoping that uh, this will help this person as well as some of the others of you. This is adding your fractions. Now, remember that when you're adding fractions, you want to get equivalent fractions so that your denominators are the same or we could say we wanted to get least common denominators or least common multiples for these denominators. Uh, I like the program and it's a godsend because the problems have come up in Milton's homework that I haven't been able to help him with. I may be able to do the problem myself, but I can't explain it to him where he would know how to do another problem of this type. With homework hotline, all he has to do is call up and the teacher gives him it's just like she's right here. Well, if you have well, to be that there, you're you're letting everyone hang out. So, you divide it. Dick, send this by Emory to Pittsburgh. And if it's not there by 10.30 tomorrow, I'm holding you personally responsible. Send this by Airborne to San Diego. And if it's not there by 10.30 a.m., Dick, you're in big trouble. Send this by Pure Later to Seattle. And you better get there by 10.30. Dick. If you were in Dick's shoes, you'd probably do what Dick's going to do. Hello, Federal. Federal Express. <laughs> when it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight.
your belt back up. Then the containers uh, uh, are loaded back onto the plane, and the planes take off anywhere between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. So this critical sorting process has taken all of approximately two hours and 15 minutes. We have moved a large fraction of our communications onto microwave and satellite channels that can be easily intercepted. And at the same time, we have adopted communications formats that make it easy for an opponent to select from the traffic available the particular pieces of information that interest him. I'm now up to round 15. This is round 16. And one more push of the button comes up with the results of deciphering 16. Stuart Katsky, repeat after me. Five, six, three, nine. Five, six, three, nine. You are authorized to transfer funds. The lunar base is one of the more obvious of the bold, exciting goals we can reach through the space station doorway. The goal of a lunar base has long been our vision. The exploration and settlement of the space frontier is going to occupy the creative thoughts and the creative energies of major portions of generations for the indefinite future. All this technology we will have with the space station takes us virtually to the moon. We see 
the first base, the very first thing to go down, will probably be something very much like space station modules, which will be carted to the surface and buried. The transportation system will be such that there will be largely unmanned vehicles, derivatives of orbital transfer vehicles that will go from Earth orbit to lunar space, and then a lander, which will go between lunar orbit and the surface of the moon. What it does do is give her an opportunity to see herself put together in many different ways that she wouldn't have the ability to do or the time to do if it were not for the magic mirror. You don't know why, but sometimes you say, I don't like the green. But it's so easy to try. One day you try the green, and you say, ah, oh, it's nice. That would be nice. Very nice of you. I think a lot of people uh, are under the misinterpretation, and this is the question of, like, of fashion photography and fine arts photography, that fashion is just dressing somebody up, putting makeup on them, and taking a picture of them. Wrong. It's much more than that. You know, I think in every industry there are people who hack things out, and there are people who feel things and, and try to make statements. in the back. Either we'll light the background evenly, but very low, or we'll throw some shapes on it. The studio, to me, means a certain kind of precise control in terms of lighting. And if I don't have that, I don't feel that it's of the quality that I would want the image to be. Because I, you can't do anything, I believe, unless the lighting is saying exactly what the feeling of the photograph is. It means controlling things very precisely and accurately and, and focusing and honing in on a subject, almost like a, I mean, it sounds very clinical, but sometimes it's almost like a surgical procedure, trying to get to the truth. I think that you can only shoot or incorporate subject matter into images that you make that are things that you are either relating to or that are important to you or that you're feeling something about at that point in your life. That's why different artists pick different things to, to use as subjects. A long time ago, 
things had to look beautiful in a in a in a kind of almost esoteric kind of way, which I understand and which I sort of relate to from artwork, paintings, you know, of the past. But now the critical thing is that things be beautiful, but that the performance have a certain truth in it. And if that doesn't happen, then to me, the whole thing is not worth it. And my way of doing that, just maybe based on my personality or what I've learned, is to try to guide people to feel certain things and be expressive in front of the camera, and also never to expect them to feel or express anything that I wouldn't be willing to feel or express. So those are the rules. I think eroticism uh, is, is absolutely essential to the work that I create. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be overt, but I think that that kind of energy um, has to be there because it's there in any complete human being. We're doing five, five six, six, so okay. we're eight and a half on here. Okay? Eight and a half, okay. Okay, right. all right. Do you want to move this way a little? Okay. Uh, I think, I think that at any there. given cultural time, historical time, that people create fashion and uh, uh, colors we'll that express the ideals, the values, and the politics, okay. the individual politics of the period. And that's why I think it's so interesting okay. the way women's clothing has changed to reflect lifestyle values and That's aspirations. Great. Really For does. instance, um, like the idea of women being taken out of out of corsets and being put into clothing that moves. There's a certain there's a real liberation in that. Yeah, let's do a Sometimes when you do a shooting, you get what you want maybe halfway through the shoot. You very rarely get it at the beginning of a shoot. Of course you don't know enough about it at the beginning, but very often you get it at the end of a shoot when you've gone through all the That's changes nice. and all the it's manipulations and you find out it's what it is up. that you have in front of you. And it usually, it's a discovery process. It takes a long time to find out what is the That's best good. of what's in front of you. It's getting better. If I feel I haven't gotten it and, and I feel that it's there, it's I nice certainly move. go for it. I work until I do get it. If I see designs that are being done by someone that I think are great, I'll call them and say, I, I love what you Let's do. I, I'd like to shoot it. And very often they will give me their things and have them photographed okay, in the way that I do. Because it's like a mutual recognition that something's being done of a very fine looks good. quality. Let's go. And it's a high. Charlotte, Sometimes people need up. other people to say, that's beautiful. Nice. I like that's it. Nice. And I hope you I do really more like of nice. it. You know, that helps. Nice. My photographs, I think, are complex, and I think they have evolved. And I think they're okay. at an interesting point in the history of fashion photography because it's the first time in history that we're looking back at fashion work that's been done and seen it in the light of yeah. art, in quotes. And I think I've used the elements and the disciplines of this particular field to make my own statement. But I really hope that I will evolve as an artist and that I will inevitably great. become involved in feature that films. Good, and I think that's I am great. definitely involved in, a, in an evolution and a growth. I, I know I'm here because I'm supposed to learn something, and I just feel that when I learn it, I'll go on to the next thing. Okay. ...to patients. For the gift of the soda and the hope that people will better understand him, Howard describes his life and his mental illness with a high degree of awareness. When I came to the hospital, I was terribly out of touch with reality. I thought God and Satan communicated with me over the radio. I was certainly not an engineer. I could not get a job teaching, even those subjects I knew well, because I no longer could show any formal preparation. I couldn't even show that I could. Hello, this is the Baltimore Radio Reading Service. May I help you? The fact that over the last two years uh, we have been able to operate the service without, uh, for the most part, any federal and or state or city money is, um, you know, a tribute to the fact that we are making progress in educating the public to the value of this kind of service and what it means to people who either don't see or have some other print handicap. 
Studios, L.A. Recording Studios, bearing 45 of the most limonines uh, stars. Springsteen also came aboard. That was something of a turning point, concedes Cragen. Howard was arrested by police at a Dunkin' Donuts store in the 600 block of Gus Ryan Street, not far from the murder scene. Why do I do it? Well, I do it because I feel it's most rewarding that I'm able to do this for people that can't do it for themselves. I enjoy reading, I enjoy speaking, and uh, I just get a lot out of it. I love it. It's 10.48 a.m. Being a totally blind person and being able to do something like this is really not an ego, it's just a plus for me. I mean, I feel good about what I'm doing and it just makes me feel 100% that I can help somebody that can't read the newspaper like myself. At least I'm part of the program. I can't read it, but I can help put it on. Catalogs with complete subjects are available free by calling the BBB Tell Tips number and requesting one. A catalog for the visually impaired is also available through the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Early on, the first opportunity would be a, a corporate application for a high-speed corporate helicopter or rotorcraft. Uh, it can go beyond that very naturally to commuter applications where you would use the vehicle at a 30 to 40 passenger size to apply to the inner city or regional to hub airport transportation system. So the tilt rotor has a it's a perfect application where you can haul very large loads over long range, high speed, without developing large airports. I am Jörn Schmier. I'm 17 years old and I'm from Heidelberg, Germany. I'm an exchange student who has come to the United States. When Johann initially came to our home, he was really on the status of guest. We didn't really know him. He didn't really know us. So we treated him as a guest and would do everything for him as you would for a normal guest. And it took really, a, I'd say, a month or so to get on a more comfortable basis of being able to tell him to do things that were household responsibilities and to stop treating him as a guest. In the beginning, it was kind of first. You have to see how are they. How am I? I thought I'd come here and be the whole time the nice person, you know, like totally perfect. But you can't be perfect for a whole year. I thought that nobody else is perfect. And I just skipped this idea of being perfect. And... and at one point, he came up to me and said that he really wanted us to yell at him. He would feel much more at home and much more part of the family after we yelled at him. 
We haven't quite made that transition yet, but we've become sterner. We haven't needed to yell at him. <laughs> it's almost like having taken in a foster child. They've been screened in terms of fitting within, but it's another semi-adult, which is walking in as a relatively mature child for a year, and you have to make the kind of adjustments you would with someone like that. OK, so you come on, people feed. When I first came into the school, they didn't treat me too much. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say too much. I was listening. and trying to catch up with the language. And sometimes you don't quite understand it. And, and you get tired over the day of just listening to English because you have to concentrate on it. But you don't have a lot of interaction when you ask every sentence. Could you repeat that, please? Excuse me? <laughs> then you, it's not that you really have interaction in the sense you have a conversation. You're listening and you try to understand and you answer something. And there I say, excuse me, could you repeat that? <laughs> when you rephrase it and rephrase it and rephrase it. The kids helped me when I, mean, I couldn't understand something or it just helped me to get along with the teachers or get along in the building or something like that explained something to me. Oops. Oh, I'm always tripping over that adorable little hook rug. Also, in the beginning, you started speaking English. Don't you worry. I've got plenty of personal liability insurance. But you didn't think in English. And then you started thinking in English, and you didn't think too much in German anymore. But suddenly, you dream in English. But your dreams are supposed to be German. And so it was kind of really more, not a shock, but surprising. What? You dream in English? And then my German mother, my German friends started speaking English in my dreams. It was, you sit there, no, 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 they don't speak English. And you wake up with a really kind of uncomfortable feeling. But now I'm used to dreaming English. The exchange program gives you for sure a better understanding of America. But understanding in the sense that you see the people how they really are, you lose a lot of your idealistic ideas. It's kind of like the glamour is leaving. You see, sometimes that's America. And like, if I would now would have to make a decision about America or say something in a relationship to America, it would perhaps be a lot more realistic. It's kind of, sometimes you see where um, opinions come from, where reactions, American reactions come from. I do. I'm really glad that I came here. The whole year, it's not only fun, but it's a lot of new yeah, things you know. see. It sounds strange. Everybody says that it's nice here and I like it. But it's really also things you don't like. It's sometimes great. And also, you not only learn something new about America or learn new language or get new friends or new family, but you also kind of learn new about yourself. I think it will be terribly hard to say goodbye to him. It's been an interesting development, really. You invite a stranger into your home. You get to know this stranger. You learn to laugh with them and cry with them and see them grow up for a year, and then they disappear. I think it'll be very difficult. We all love him. Somebody, everybody has to have an armband. Everybody has to have their name on the armband. Brian, if you big boy name, hey, we're going to let everybody listen to their hearts. We're going to find out how to take our pulses, all right? And everybody gets their blood pressure taken. Turn around. Around to me. Make up a name of a street boy, something that would go with Lucy Skywalker. Make up a doctor. Okay. Who's your doctor when you get to that? <laughs> if you were Lucy Skywalker, right? Okay. Okay, my pump are ready. Okay, pump, pump, pump. Pump. No calories. 102 over 80. You're all right, Nicholas. When a patient comes in, is we hook them up to the heart monitor. Oh, okay. Okay. You should 
start seeing some scribbly lines on the screen. What do you think they are? Friends? We gotta get enough for everybody to have a strip. Okay. <laughs> wanna have one now? Yeah. Okay. Because we gotta test them. We gotta see what, what kind of germs they are. So we give him oxygen through his nose, okay? And it helps make his heart work a little, little better. I can feel it. Put it I on my feel it. it. I can feel it. I didn't feel it. So I don't want to ever put one on anybody your size, do I? Hmm? Are you going to put one on my head? This ice. Did this feel uh, like ice? Uh, one. Now I'm going to show you why it doesn't hurt when I clean Justin's arm off, because I'm going right down one side of it. <laughs> and I'm going right down this side. You're going to look like an Indian, aren't you? Yeah, right down that side. And right down this side, okay? Now, I never touched your cut, did I, Justin? Okay. My mom did that. the bubble. Mm -hmm. okay. did now, Justin, I'm not going to cut you. I'm going to cut the tape. I mean, the bandage, okay? A little splint here, and on one side, the blue side, that's just foam. It's nice and soft, okay? And now, we're just going to put a little bit of tape around the tip here. Okay. No, it's kind of gonna keep that one. She may keep it. It's her. It's her splint. Mm -hmm. A little bit of tape on this side. Now, if I put this splint on right now, it doesn't do anything to stop you from Can moving I it, does it? I know. Isn't that awful? <coughs> it's plaster dust. Okay. Yes, you do. Because once this starts to get dry, it starts to get warm. Okay, and then it gets hard, and that's what makes it work when it gets hard. And this is a special bandage. It's shaped just like Terry's hand. No. Nope. This one, the um, about. Um, helping people. I learned about um, um, this one about the heart. I get two. Put the cookie on your lap. Here are all your charts that you all registered out there. You remember when you registered out there? The purpose of the program basically is to educate children to hopefully alleviate some of their fear of coming to an emergency room. The other aspect of the program is just one simple word, love for children. I enjoy it immensely. Boys and girls, my name is Artie Frieda, and this is my little pal Luigi. Hello, how do you do? Tell the people your real name. Luigi L. Luigi. Uh huh. What does the Yell stand for? And Luigi. <laughs> Lu Luigi, uh huh. Um, you would like to sing a little song? Oh, yeah. Everywhere you go, sunshine follows you. Everywhere you go, Skies are always blue. Children love you, they seem to know. You get roses out of the snow. Let go the string. The whole world says hello. Hello. Every I do this for the love of the people. I don't do it for the money. Uh, the satisfaction I get is to see a lot of people smiling and, and happy. When I do a show in a nursing home, uh, and Luigi makes them forget about their medicine for the day, and Luigi makes them forget about the shots that they have to get. Luigi makes them forget about the physical therapy. Then Luigi looks directly at the people and tells them, well, if I made you smile and I made you happy today, then I did a job for the man upstairs, and good afternoon and God bless you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
When I did a show uh, in, the, in the Bush area, in Guyana, they have what they call the YY Indians, and they have their own language. And some of the missionaries, in fact, some of the missionaries from, the, from Washington was on the same plane with me, and they taught me how to count. So then when Luigi started to count in YY language, that really flipped them. They couldn't figure how a little wooden head boy like that can, uh, can count. I also do fire eating, but that went over like a pork chop at a Jewish wedding because they worship fire. So when I started eating fire, I could see them walking away from me. So the ambassador just told me to cool it a little bit. Why did I taste it? I'm telling you, when they start to, when they start to steam, then we put the cover on. Oh, oh yeah. Now yeah. oh, we're gonna have a ball tonight. I'm oh you. yeah, we're gonna have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I made a price over for you. Oh, very oh, good. Oh, mm -hmm. boy, I'm telling you. How long do you cook it? Twenty minutes. As soon as it starts to boil. I'm not a doctor. I can't cure anybody, but laughter is good medicine, you know. Because you feel that you. That, that you're doing something for your fellow man, whether it's, you know, adults or children. Then you go home, you get a good night's sleep, you don't need a sleeping pill because you did your job for the day. And I'm happy to do it. And I'll do it over and over again till the good Lord takes me. Luigi, uh-huh. If you put your right hand in your right hand pocket and you found five dollars, wee! Then you put your left hand in your left hand pocket and you found another five dollars, wee! You tell the nice boys and girls, what would you have? Somebody else's pants. Yeah. <laughs>